This is Report to Wyoming. This show targets issues in Natrona County where I talk to real people about their thoughts and ideas. For this episode, I'm talking with Katie Ray. She's a human trafficking survivor as well as an activist and advocate, a.k.a. the TikTok advocate. January is Sex Trafficking Awareness and Prevention Month, so she was the perfect guest for this topic. I do want to add a trigger warning. This episode contains highly sensitive information that might be distressing to some, including references to sexual violence and abuse. With that, here we go. I start things off by asking Katie to take me back to where her story first begins. I was born in Billings, Montana, in a religious cult that is federally recognized called Curly Thornton Ministries. And at this point, was it already pretty established or brand new? When I was born into this cult, it was, I'd say, at its halfway point. At its inception is when my parents married into it. Mm. Were they, um, did they have to leave their own family members behind? Was it something that uh, maybe their parents or siblings scrutinized? There were a lot of people in my parents' circles who had questions and concerns This group was very fanatical, very radical, and yet their mindsets and thought processes were all entirely around spreading the word of Jesus. Their concept and mission was to proselytize the world with a radical love for Jesus and bringing others into that as well. So the red flags seemed to be subsided on occasion by the fact that this man claimed to love Jesus radically and wanted other people to do the same. How do you think your parents were then converts, would we say? My parents had the same belief system that was blanketed over this cult. They both came similarly from either evangelical Christianity or Catholicism, which was the basis of this cult and its belief systems. So there would not have been much conversion or much change in ideals. And was it, um, is it something that we're referring to as the, would you say the name again, the Curly? Curly Thornton Ministries. The Curly Thornton Ministries. Was was that something that they were like, yes, we'll be a part of this? Or is that how people in retrospect refer to it? When they first joined, it was like Bible studies. Mm. It was small gatherings of people hearing a charismatic man talk about his passion for Christ and his desire for others to follow in his footsteps of passionately proselytizing to the world. And I think we see that a lot in everyday evangelical Christianity. Bible studies turn into action, turn into proselytizing in the street. This one just came with embezzling money and the rape of women and children. Mm. And by this time, when your parents had joined and then had their own children, so you come along, was that all those kind of darker aspects of this cult? Was that already happening? From my understanding, yes. I was pretty young when I was born into this cult. And um, by the time we escaped, A vast amount of my memories were right before we escaped, and the information that I have was shared with me by other family members who remember more than I do. But most of the really dark parts of the cult began during the middle portions when a leadership ring was established and a hierarchy was established and... That hierarchy controlled everything from what cult members wore, what cars they drove, what jobs they had, what houses they lived in, who babysat their children, and where their money went. When the hierarchy was established, everything went downhill. Mm. The power grab was established and essential in cult life. And you either lived under its rule or threats of calling CPS on you were were looming over you and your family. CPS is sort of like an internal s- system? Child Protective Services. They threatened uh, to call Child Protective Services on anyone who didn't fall in line with the power structure. What about your childhood? Do you have fond memories of that? The occasional fond memory, yes. I remember fond memories of our trampoline, I really liked jumping on the trampoline as a kid. 
It was a time away. I, I also have several teachers that I'm very fond of and still in, in connection with to this day who were a safe space when very small amounts of my childhood were safe. So I do have some, not many, but the some that I do have, I hold on to. At what point did you realize that something wasn't quite right with what was going on at home? When we were presented a movie at school called The Good Touch, Bad Touch Video. And if you saw this video in the 90s, it was a video talking about bodily autonomy, enthusiastic consent, and how there is touch that is inherently not okay, and that would be sexual touch. And they talked about the importance of telling a safe adult in the event that you have experienced this. When this video came out, there was a requirement for parents to sign a permission slip for you to watch it. And our parents said no. And then they rented the movie. They brought it home on VHS. They showed it to all of us. And then they gaslit us and said all of the reasons why that's not what was happening to our family. What was taking place in our home was for religious purposes and for all of these other reasons. But it wasn't sexual abuse. Unfortunately for them, there was no putting anything back where it was before we now had a word for what we were enduring and it was sexual abuse. Was it kind of a group revelation? You and I know we don't want to necessarily name anybody who's not comfortable telling their story, but you were in a home with siblings. Mm -hmm. Is that safe to say? So I won't, like you said, I won't tell my siblings story. That's for them to tell. But for me, it was world collapsing because my abuse wasn't just internal it was also external I thought what was happening in my home was normal and peer-on-peer abuse became very normal in my life and I did not realize that what was happening to me wasn't also taking place in other people's homes and the revelation that this thing that was happening was called sexual abuse and it not only wasn't normal but it wasn't healthy and it wasn't okay shattered my existence, realizing I had brought that into other children's lives as well. And I was responsible for their harm. Just as a as an elementary child, realizing that I was now a, a person who'd caused harm in someone else's life. How do you cope at a young age like this? Drugs and alcohol. I started drinking and using drugs at the age of 10. And there were far too many teachers, instead of asking, why is a kid using drugs and drinking in elementary school, saying, wow, that kid's using drugs and drinking in elementary school. They're going down the wrong road. They must be hanging out with the wrong people. They're going to head the wrong direction. I did the very best I could to just stay alive. And I coped with every single mechanism I knew possible that would help me escape. Did you become antagonistic at home, uncooperative, um, just sort of after you'd had that revelation? um, How did that change the dynamics at home? I did. I fought back against my sexual abuse a lot more once that revelation came to light. Um, More so, I tried to not be at home as much as possible. I tried to spend time with friends outside of the house. I tried to find ways to spend extra time at school. Against my parents, no, I was was never antagonistic, and I never fought back against anything that they had to say or anything that they did because uh, this deeply embedded indoctrination of obedience or being physically abused. At what point does it all rear its ugly head and things for your family don't work anymore? At one point, one of my family members was so bold to step forward and tell. And it all came crashing down. Mm -hmm. And my dad was convicted and incarcerated. And my siblings and I were left to try to pick the pieces of our life back up with really no idea how. I was still using drugs and drinking regularly, failing classes, struggling to maintain attentiveness through an undiagnosed CPTSD disorder and, um, or excuse me, an undiagnosed disassociative disorder and raging CPTSD. Everything felt really out of body for most of my childhood and early teen years. And that maybe 
was your body trying to find a way out? Oh, it really was. Honestly, it was trying to either escape the body that I was in or it was trying to find an escape from the trauma that kept trying to remind me of everything I had been through. Now, I imagine for many years after that, it's got to be hard to find hope, right? Yeah. How did you eventually find a light at the end of the tunnel? I got to a point where it was either live or die because I really didn't want to live anymore. And multiple failed suicide attempts told me that maybe I wasn't supposed to die. And I started intensive trauma therapy. And one session after the other, I felt a little less like it might swallow me whole. And I felt a little more like I could possibly do this. And I kept going, and I kept going, and I kept showing up to sessions. And eventually I got to a point where I felt I could cope without drugs and alcohol. I felt like I could breathe the air and hear the sound of the wind and the trees and not want to collapse in on myself. That's so intense. Um, I can't even imagine just trying to live a normal, I don't love the word normal, but trying to be a functional member of society Mm, is how to put it. Yeah. Which is a big part of what you do now is helping other people with that as well. Yeah. So a lot of people know me as the TikTok advocate. I use my social media platforms to elevate survivor stories in the fierce pursuit of justice for other survivors who have yet to get it. I educate around signs and symptoms of grooming, sextortion, exploitation. I am an advocate and an activist for the sexually exploited, the human trafficked, and the abused as a survivor myself. And it's a huge platform. You have all kinds of people um, that are participating, like a following of sorts, Mm -hmm. national, maybe global. Mm -hmm. Um, But as far as Wyoming even, do you feel like there, we still have a long way to go in terms of helping um, survivors. Oh, absolutely. Especially when far too much of our legislation has been written by people who have never experienced the atrocities they're creating legislation for. And especially when the legislation has far too many holes in it, that can lead to protections for abusers and not furthering justice for survivors. We've got long, a, lot, a long way to go in a lot of aspects. As far as your platform, would you say this is mostly about helping people who are now on the other side? Or do you also try to reach people that might be in the middle of it? Honestly, it's an, it's an umbrella of advocacy and activism. It's a wide spectrum of wanting to educate helpers of the world who may encounter survivors one day, who may encounter someone who's in active abuse, to wanting to reach survivors who aren't on the other side yet and they're wanting to find freedom, to those who are on the other side and they want to seek justice. It's a wide spectrum that I hope... And I've seen fruit of it having helped many, and I hope it continues to do so. I imagine it is really helpful to have a group in a space where you can talk about your experiences without people gawking or just asking all of the the really personal questions that come with the territory. When I had uh, talked to Uprising, I was surprised. Well, I went to one of their conferences. I was surprised to find out that many victims of trafficking, um, even if they break the cycle and they get out of it, we'll go back to it eventually. And so I wonder if like, yeah, being in a group and being able to talk about it in a way is helpful for, um, I guess, preventing relapse. So the recidivism rate with human trafficking survivors is as high as it is because of our lack of resources, our lack of support for survivors of human trafficking. And Uh, In a lot of cases, uh, a financial need. Obviously, there are situations in human trafficking where there is no financial benefit for the individual being trafficked. And in other situations, there are. They're being housed. They're being fed. They're being clothed. And 
there are situations where going back means that they can survive versus being on the street. And our resources improving for survivors getting out and being able to become just being able to survive on the other side of such atrocity in a world that really doesn't care if you make it or not. Those those resources really have to improve if we're going to reduce that recidivism rate. What kind of in a perfect world, what would we have set up? Something where people could safely reach out, but without the fear of um, repercussions. I'm just thinking about people like hiding in plain sight. That's always kind of bugged me. You hear stories now, especially with social media, about people like slipping uh, slipping someone a card or something with mm. like, help me on the back of it. Mm-hmm. Even that is pretty, you're asking a lot of the other person who might also just be like a small person next to You've got an abuser who might be like a big guy as well. For sure, for sure. Stuff like that. You know, and we talk about that a lot in our trainings is, you know, how safe is it to really put something like that in the hands of a survivor who is very likely in an unsafe situation. But maybe, maybe one day she'll be in a situation where she can call. I truly believe that one of the most important things that we can do to make it safe for survivors of human trafficking to come forward who are currently still actively being trafficked is to decriminalize sex work, especially when we're talking about street sex work. Because when pimps, madams, and handlers are protected by the law and those that are being trafficked are not, they cannot come forward safely and say, I'm being trafficked. They get ticketed and told that they're doing sex work, and then they spend a weekend in jail hoping they get bailed out. They have to have a safety net for coming forward. And I truly believe one of the ways of making that possible is to decriminalize sex work on the street. And what about other kind of things people could be doing, even thinking about uh, child victims Mm -hmm. who may become survivors, but in the midst of it? Um, This would be, we kind of talked about what people can be doing in public schools and Mm -hmm. sporting events, all kinds of things where safe adults are around all kinds of children Mm -hmm. and maybe they could spot things. Yeah. So this is something I'm really passionate about is trying to get trauma-informed care trained legislation nationwide mandated so so fewer students fall through the cracks in the education system. And not just for teachers, but all the helpers of the world. You've got police officers and medical staff, people who are in contact with children often, who may not recognize the signs and the symptoms of active abuse, but once trained properly, they have the ability to turn on crisis mode and they have particular crisis training that would walk them through mandated reporting status and what to do next if a child is in crisis. Yeah, because so often delinquent behavior, I think, is the word that you used. Yeah, that gets placed on a kid and then they're labeled as just bad. Yeah. Versus maybe that's a cry for help. Oh, for sure. So many of the behaviors that we see in what's labeled delinquent behavior are signs of a deeper rooted issue. If, If someone would just ask, why? Why is this kid behaving this way? Why is this kid so oppositional and throwing chairs and screaming all the time and using drugs and alcohol and skipping class and their grades are dropping? And why? If someone would just ask why and dig deeper, they might find an answer that would shock them. And that child could potentially experience less abuse as a result of being pulled from an abusive home. Mm. Mm -hmm. And those are the kids that are in public school. Yeah. Oh, public school, private school. But All yeah, over the homeschooled kids. Um, there have been incidents recently where it's it's hard to imagine what it w- would have been like being in a home where you don't ever really get anybody checking in very often. Yeah. So that's, that's a nightmare. How did you end up finding your voice? Have you always been able to be so vocal um, and strong, or was that a process? That was definitely a process. That was through figuring out who I was as a person and. That took what felt like a lifetime. But through intensive trauma therapy and recognizing I can have healthy boundaries and I can love myself broken and still processing my trauma, I can have it live alongside me instead of controlling me. I found I am worth loving. I am valuable. And I am worthy of all the things this life has to offer. I do not have to 
suffer anymore. And I started finding joy in little things like seeing a flower on a spring day or seeing what shapes I could find in the clouds. It, it was so little. And I started the process of healing my inner child, things that I would have done as a child that I couldn't do as a child because childhood was just so extraordinarily unsafe. I started doing them as an adult. And through the process of healing my inner child and navigating things with her, I started finding a love in adulthood that I didn't know was possible. Hmm. And a lot of people who find themselves in these situations where they're being abused are so vulnerable. It often happens at a young age mm-hmm. or it, it targets sometimes. Well, I guess we could talk about this, too. I see it a lot as a socioeconomic issue, but that's not really the case because nobody's safe from it. Anybody nobody's could safe. be targeted. Everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it doesn't it's not like an abuser looks like one kind of thing. Correct. So there there are particular groups of people who are at greater risk when we're talking about um, abuse, sextortion, exploitation and human trafficking. Those are our black, brown, indigenous, other people of color communities, LGBTQIA+, the immigrant community, our foster and adoptee youth, and our disabled community. The youth inside of those communities are at greatest risk of being targets of these types of abuses and exploitations. And yet no one goes unscathed There are people in every demographic who experience it. We just know when it's intersecting with those particular communities, the risk increases significantly. Yeah, and when things get brought to my attention, it's always usually because an arrest has been made or there's an investigation going on. Yeah. And so I do wonder, you know, I know how many registered sex offenders we have, Mm -hmm. but it does make you wonder how many we really have. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think a lot of people see movies and TV shows and think, yeah, it happens in other countries or in other states, but it really doesn't happen here. Wyoming is a truck stop state, which means we're on one of the highest trafficking highways in the United States, Mm -hmm. which means human trafficking is absolutely very prevalent here. And you also have to understand that studies show 50% of Human trafficking is familial, which means it happens inside of your family unit, which means it's completely undetected and it's understudied. That's an auntie every Thursday trafficking her nephew to pay the light bill. That's a dad trafficking his daughter for compensation to pay the mortgage. That's some guy, a janitor at a school trafficking a handful of the young school kids every time they go to the amusement park for some kind of field trip. It's in our schools. It's in our churches. It's in our police departments. It's in CPS. It's in our neighborhoods. It's quite literally everywhere. And the moment that you have that realization, you're going to break past the particular groups you believe are responsible for it and recognize the most important thing you can do is get yourself educated on what it looks like so that you can become a helper of the world, too. And then I think about loopholes. What kind of things are, I guess I'll say abusers. Mm -hmm. What kind of loopholes are they looking for? It would be access, I guess. Mm -hmm. Most children who experience uh, physical, primarily sexual abuse and human trafficking, experience it at the hands of somebody that they know. And grooming is utilized to do that. The grooming process, gaining access comfortability, trust, gifting, and then the process of isolating them away from their loved ones, requiring secrets, and then eventually this process of introducing them to things that normally their parents would not allow them to participate in or watch, like the consumption of pornography, and then eventually acting upon the things that are being taught in these sessions of indulging in content that's not appropriate for their age. The grooming process is so insidious, but it is imperative to an abuser's ability to gain access to and successfully abuse a child. This is a little wild, but last year at the, um, or two years ago at the state legislature, there was someone who was asking or proposing that sex offenders not have to register. Um, Um. I know. And this was I almost had her on because I just wanted to hear why. And I 
never did because I wasn't super comfortable with it at that point. But I, it makes me think a lot about what should we be doing with convicted sex offenders? A lot of our audience will comment, you know, get a rope, <laughs> terrible things, yeah. death sentence. Yeah. Um, I see a lot of these convictions, you know, maybe 20, 50 years in prison. Um, yeah. The most recent uh, person who was sentenced, I think, will serve a cap of 12. He's actually out on bond right now, mm-hmm. um, which means that with good behavior, that might be half, of, you know, six years and then back out. Yeah. So what do you think should happen? Is it very case by case or do you have um, strong feelings about it? I think there are a multitude of avenues that could be taken. The first one that comes to mind is restorative justice. Restorative justice is an avenue not used by our penal system, but usually used by indigenous tribes, peacemaking circles where the individual who has harmed another is required to take full responsibility for what they've done and make it right in whatever way the survivor sees right must be made, whether that be compensating the losses of the person's entire future that was taken away because of what was done when they were a child or what have you. There are so many potential outcomes with restorative justice. I think there are some circumstances I don't see restoration possible. I know those who work primarily in restorative justice believe there's restoration for all. I see circumstances where my bias leans in, having seen the worst of the worst in my line of work, where I can't possibly imagine someone getting an opportunity to restore things, and a lifetime sentence should be the bare minimum. And abuse is such a cycle. We see people who were abused abuse. Yes. Um... You know, how, can you reintegrate someone into society when they've done the most egregious things to, like, children? It There genuinely is such an understanding that I have because of being trauma-informed care trained, recognizing that abuse often begets abuse and having a desperate need to address that. Our current system, as it functions, does not reform anyone. You turn criminals into criminals all over again and then you turn them back out into society there's classes that they have to pass inside in order to get out early but I know what those classes entail and sitting someone down and having them recite touching kids is bad isn't going to do it Mm -hmm. these people need intensive psychosex trauma therapy in order to address what's taken place in their life that manifested into than perpetrating the abuse that they also endured. Is there anywhere that people even could go if they were having those thoughts without being immediately taken into custody? That sounds weird, but it's like, what happens if someone did have those thoughts or they want it out? It seems like maybe there should be something there. So you can't be taken into custody for having those thoughts. You get taken into custody when you act on them. There are psychosex therapists that work specifically with people who have pedophilic ideations. And I believe that the more psychosex therapists that work alongside people with pedophilic ideations, the safer our society will be. And you're going to have listeners right now who are saying, no, the more ropes and, you know, pits of fire that we bring out, the safer our society will be. I hear you. I get you. I'm not knocking where you're at. Everybody's at a different place when we're talking about this topic. And For me, I believe if we get to the root of the issue, we are no longer going to continue spitting out generations after generations of continued cycles of abuse. One of the words that always comes up with anything, any hot button topic is awareness, awareness, awareness. And I do agree. That's really good. But that seems to be really all we have um, for both survivors and abusers. The pain. <laughs> so when it comes to action, it's like, okay, we have to think about this from all angles. And so I think about two people who've been preyed upon and end up in a situation like yours when you were younger in some kind of a cult. Yeah. That's crazy, too, because now they genuinely believe what they're doing is it's okay. That's really terrifying when yeah. the moral... Um, code behind it justifies those behaviors yeah oh yeah especially when you have 
so much indoctrination that goes into all of it. Lies compound lies compound lies equal this must be true. This must be okay, especially if it's normalized. If you have someone who once was a child and they were physically, sexually, psychologically abused and then had an early introduction into pornography and then later as they started dating became violently abusive in their sexual interactions with women because the pornography they were watching was violently abusive. Mm -hmm. And then as they started having children, they began sexually abusing their children. Could we see how this cycle of abuse began and then would we ask, where do we stop that before it starts? Right. That would be ideal if yeah. we could just prevent it altogether. Yeah. Yeah. Awareness is so important, especially if you have children in proximity to you, whether you're a caretaker or you're a helper of the world and you just want to ensure that the people around you are safe, that the kiddos in your neighborhood are doing okay. So if you have the opportunity to get yourself trauma-informed care trained, it can benefit quite literally everyone in your community. And once you do, be careful how you assess the world around you because you'll start seeing things through a trauma-informed care lens and everything will look like abuse immediately. Everything will look like trafficking immediately. So pause, reflect, and... Um, Go be the best you can be. I know it can be hard hearing topics like this and not sure what to do with it. But the best that we can be is just a person that shows up. Again, that was Katie Ray. You can find her on TikTok at the TikTok Advocate. I do want to end this episode by providing some resources. Um, the first is the Wyoming Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Their phone number is 844-264-8080. Also, the National Sexual Assault Hotline is 1-800-656-4673. If you or someone you know is being trafficked, the National Human Trafficking Hotline is 888-373-7888. This has been Report to Wyoming, presented in the public interest by Town Square Media.